Hello everyone. In 1815, a congress of ambassadors from all main European powers gathered in Vienna, Austria, to reorganize Europe. For almost 25 years, the continent had been at war. A series of wars that started shortly after the French Revolution and reached a never-seen-before intensity. From Portugal to Russia, all these years of battles and armies moving across the continent had devastated the land, killed hundreds of thousands, and shaken the thrones of well-established dynasties like the Habsburgs in Austria the Romanovs in Russia, or the Hohenzollerns in Prussia. The kings of France, the Bourbon, had lost their throne for a generation and had just taken it back, at least for now. But the one man whose name and legacy had to be erased by this conference was obviously absent. He had been sent into exile, far away to the southern Atlantic, a prison he would never come back from. His name had already been added to the short list of legendary conquerors. He was admired or hated. He had had one of the most meteoric rises ever seen, followed by a spectacular downfall and his first name would stay attached to this age of chaos that just ended. Napoleon. Tonight, we're going to explore these 20, 25 years that saw the rise and fall of Napoleon, at least the first half of it. What happened? Who was he? We will follow him from his birthplace in Corsica to Italy, to Egypt, to Paris. We will also talk about politics and diplomacy. Society at the time of the French Revolution. Warfare in the early 19th century. And in the second part, we will follow Napoleon across the battlefields of Europe until the collapse of his dreams of domination. And I will tell you about the aftermath of Napoleonic Wars that marked the rest of the century, from their impact on European regimes to the redrawing of frontiers or the rise of new powers like Great Britain and Prussia, the predecessor to unified Germany. So we have a lot to explore and this is why we're going to do it in two parts. Tonight we will relive the wars of the French Revolution and follow Napoleon in his rise to power until he took the reins of France. In the second part, that will be available in a few days, we will relive the years when he rose higher than anyone could have imagined, only to lose everything in the end. As always, all you have to do is just let me guide you and relax. You may close your eyes at any time because you won't need visual supports to follow along. And if you fall asleep, there are timestamps in the first comment or on your screen to help you resume the story. You can also download this story in audio or video format from my Patreon page together with dozens more 
if you decide to support the channel and if that suits you better you can listen to my stories on streaming platforms like Spotify or Apple Music the links are in the first comment too now take one single deep breath and exhale slowly gently release the tension in your shoulders your arms your legs even in your fingers that may be slightly contracted we are going to travel back in time more than 200 years ago and our journey begins right now what are the napoleonic wars technically they are a series of conflicts that pitted the french empire and its allies against several coalitions of other european powers to which the main participants were great britain austria prussia and russia but wars began on a large scale in europe before that as soon as the french revolution began in 1789 it was met with worries and hostility from other european countries at least from their governments first because it was a threat to the traditional political order across continental europe kingdoms in the 18th century were mainly autocracies they had hereditary dynasties of kings with different legal systems and rules and different sets of rights for their sovereigns but the one thing this order was based on was a very extended royal power and a society of castes that was determined by birthright depending on your social origin your occupation or the region where you were born your rights and duties could be very different from other inhabitants of the same kingdom but the acceptance of this social order in which members of the aristocracy were strongly privileged and the power of the rulers had few checks this was diminishing there were occasional revolts of peasants when harvests were bad or when new taxes were raised but this phenomenon had existed for a long time now even a wealthier class of educated people some of them very wealthy and sometimes even wealthier than the aristocrats because many new fortunes had appeared in the 18th century were critical of these regimes that limited their liberties not just their political liberties their economic liberties too the ideas developed by philosophers along the 18th century had uh, infused a growing educated population from the bourgeoisie but also parts of the aristocracy or the clergy that had turned critical of society across Europe and with varying degrees the disconnect between the regimes the traditions and parts of the population created tensions of a new kind the only large country in Europe that was not too much shaken by this discomfort was Great Britain because in the UK the society had already evolved towards an equalization of rights and a constitutional monarchy kings had more power than they have today but political power had already shifted to a parliament on top of this 
underlying unrest in European kingdoms. The governments were constantly faced with funding issues that weakened them. The states were in a process of centralization and took on more and more responsibilities. They had to pay for permanent armies and navies, an interior police. They sponsored manufacturers or large public works, which was a drain on their budgets and forced them to uh, borrow money. As soon as there was a war, the deficit could rocket up and new taxes had to be raised. So fiscal pressure was constantly rising, fueling discontent, all the more that the aristocracy and the church didn't pay taxes. So governments took the money where they could find it. They had to tax the rest of the population, generally more modest people. They taxed goods that came in or went out, or they made their colonies pay through direct taxes or taxes on trade. In no small part, for example, the revolt of the 13 colonies in America was triggered by taxation of trade and the way the British restricted free trade in their own colonies for economic and financial reasons. The poverty of governments contrasted with the relative wealth of their population. The 18th century was a period of economic growth, and as I told you earlier, many new fortunes based on trade, manufactures, or banking had appeared. This was only for a very small part of the population. The vast majority were still peasants and owned very little. But entire regions like France, Great Britain, Germany, the north of Italy, the Netherlands, had grown significantly wealthier along the century. Still, the main source of wealth was uh, agriculture, and a good 80% of the population produced food or agricultural products. There were no big surpluses of grain and other foods, so bad harvests were still feared, because all countries were never more than 12 months away from a shortage of food in case of bad weather. Now, the French Revolution was the product of all these risks to the existing order, converging at the same time. The insatisfaction with the regime and society at large, the near bankruptcy of the state that could no longer fund itself without big reforms and had to impose heavier and heavier taxes on a, a part of the population, the existence of alternative models too, like the British constitutional monarchy or the American Republic. And on top of that, bad harvests that made the price of bread rise to unbearable levels. When it started, in 1789, all royal courts across Europe were shocked, but they recognized immediately what was happening in Madrid, in St. Petersburg, in Vienna, in Berlin, they quickly understood that one of their worst nightmares was actually happening in France. Autocratic kings feared not only for their prerogatives or their thrones, the worries were broader because it was the entire social order that uh, they stood for, that they represented that was now threatened. At first, it was not too bad yet, because the revolutionaries of 1789 only turned France into a constitutional monarchy, something close to and actually inspired by the English model. This dramatically limited the power of the king, Louis XVI, 
that he was kept as head of state under autocracies in Europe, especially Austria and Prussia, were hostile to this revolution, but war didn't start immediately. And it is actually the revolutionary French assembly that declared it on Austria and Prussia in 1792, in front of the preparations for war that these countries were making and also because the revolution was in the process of turning more radical. In September of the same year, the monarchy was abolished and a republic was proclaimed, which was horrifying to hereditary monarchies across Europe. In 1793, the following year, the situation quickly turned almost desperate for the French Republic. On the one hand, it was attacked from all sides by its neighbors. And on top of that, there were internal revolts that supported the return to the monarchy. In response, the Republican Assembly called for a massive total mobilization to fight its enemies, internal and external. This period was called the Terror because of the repression and large-scale executions that took place. Probably the most violent phase of the French Revolution. But it did wonders for the young republic. Externally, invaders were repelled on all fronts, and revolutionary armies advanced even beyond the frontiers. Internally, the majority of royalist revolts were suppressed at a huge human cost, but efficiently, and in 1794-1795 it appeared that this young French Republic was in a much better place. It was now on the offensive, and the situation of internal chaos had been mostly sorted out. Just one year before, in 1793, the port of Toulon, on the Mediterranean Sea in the south of France, had revolted a royalist revolt, and the insurgents had called English and Spanish forces to their rescue. Both countries were happy to oblige, and they sent ships and troops. The port was besieged and retaken by a French revolutionary army, and a very young artillery captain from Corsica, Napoleon Bonaparte, was noticed for his efficient contribution to the siege. Like for many officers from the small nobility like him, or ordinary people that had embraced the revolutionary side, Opportunities for a quick rise in the army didn't lack. High-ranking positions prior to the revolution were held by aristocrats who had deserted for the majority of them. They had gone into exile or been arrested. For an entire generation of soldiers and low-ranking officers, there was a once-in-a-lifetime occasion to rise and replace them thanks to their merits or their connections. Bonaparte had both, as we will see later, and the following years would be very fastuous for him. But not just for him, a generation of military commanders that became highly skilled and trained during these years of continuous warfare also emerged, and the ones who survived participated later in the Napoleonic Wars as his generals. All of them rather ordinary people who were not destined to very high functions in the old order, and turned the revolution into a personal opportunity. Names like Davou, Lan, or Ney. In 1795, France had invaded the Austrian Netherlands 
that corresponded approximately to modern Belgium. Belgium did not exist yet. And uh, then they had pushed to the north, to the Dutch Republic, that had been turned officially into a sister republic. But what sister meant here was more a satellite or a puppet state. At this point, the war had changed from a mostly defensive conflict at the beginning into a war of invasion. So why this reversal? First, because they could. The coalition against France was lacking coordination. France had been able to raise a bigger and more efficient army than any of its opponents. When the war had started, many countries in the coalition had an opportunistic approach. They hoped to benefit from a temporary weakness of France to take territories they had their eyes on, and they counted on a quick victory to secure a profitable operation for them. The French monarchy would be restored. This would make an example of what happened to countries that revolted against the traditional order. And as a bonus, they would gain territorial or financial advantages. Except the expected victory never came, and after three years, it was starting to look like a disaster, especially for Austria. The French had repelled Austrian armies that had performed quite poorly, and now they were marching towards Austria on two different axes, one through Germany and the other through the north of Italy, with an army commanded by a certain General Bonaparte. There were other reasons to this French expansionism. There was the theory that bringing the revolution to other countries would free them and secure allies in this new international order. And there were also less respectable reasons for war. War was advantageous. It was a factor of internal stability because it mobilized the population and uh, distracted from internal troubles. Politically, it gave more power to uh, the government and the National Assembly. And also it was profitable. Assets could be seized abroad and uh, sold or exploited. This question of uh, economy, finance and property is also important to understand the Napoleonic years that would come later. The French Revolution was not just about human rights and a change in the regime. The new French Republic presided over a massive economic and social change in the 1790s. First, all privileges had been abolished, meaning that, at least on paper, everyone was a citizen and all citizens had equal rights. The Catholic Church had been stripped of all its privileges too, like tax exemptions, and its properties had been confiscated, together with assets taken to aristocrats in exile or to the ex-crown. This formed the bulk of a gigantic pool of assets, called the national assets, that the government auctioned to whomever could buy them, land, forests, building, furniture, many of them generated income from their exploitation or because they were rented. Prior to the revolution, the clergy was the single largest land and real estate owner of the kingdom, with maybe a third of uh, everything of all existing assets. This gives you an idea of the scale of this phenomenon. A lot of these asset sales were met at bargain prices, 
because they had to be sold fast. The entire new elite of this new regime participated in this, from merchants to generals to lawyers to doctors to bankers. For a large part of the upper middle and upper class that supported the revolution, this was a huge opportunity. And in the 1790s, there was a massive redistribution of assets and wealth in France, at the expense of the ancient orders, especially the church. This is important politically, because the new ruling class that had benefited so much from the revolution, from the abolition of all privileges to this huge redistribution of assets, would now support any regime that would guarantee the preservation of what they had gained. They wanted order, stability, and no return of the old aristocracy or of an absolute monarch. Years later, Bonaparte would become the best place to ensure exactly this, and they supported him as long as he could protect their interests. Obviously, Napoleon was never a democratically elected leader in the modern sense, but you cannot govern a country just on your own. Even dictators have popular support of some sort. They rely on certain parts of the society. Later in our story, he will rise to the head of France after a series of events that are crucial in themselves. But behind these events, he could reach power and stay there for years because he had won over a large part of the population, either through military glory and prestige, or through the promise of stability, order and preservation of gains that uh, he represented. But at this point, in 1796, Napoleon was still a long way from the imperial throne. There was not even a throne yet, because France was still a republic that had recently turned expansionist. General Bonaparte, as he was called at this point, led French armies throughout the north of Italy, and he won a number of battles against two main opponents, the kingdoms of Sardinia and uh, Austria. This campaign was disastrous for the Austrians. They lost thousands of men, especially at the siege of Mantua, and Bonaparte entered uh, the region of Tyrol, a mountainous region in the west of Austria, the road to the capital, Vienna, was now open and nothing was left to stop his army. So the Austrian government sued for peace in 1797. At this point, the political situation had changed in Paris. The more radical faction of revolutionaries and its most prominent figure, Robespierre, had fallen, and their leaders had been executed. The period of terror was over, and a, a new organization had been put in place at the head of the Republic. A so-called directory of five directors. They controlled the country and its conquests, but at the head of the army, Several generals had begun to follow a strategy of their own. This sounds weird nowadays, because in a modern country, any military commander that doesn't obey scrupulously the orders of the government or his superiors would be destituted and court-martialed. But the situation was different back then. In the chaos of the war, and political instability, the army, and even various armies, had formed entities of their own that followed orders and a strategy 
but at the heads of which generals had acquired a lot of autonomy. They were still expected to obey, but they used this leeway to promote themselves and sometimes treat directly with other powers without asking for permission. And this is exactly what Napoleon did in Italy. He made sure his victories were known and even embellished in Paris. Among other generals like Moreau, who was leading the northern offensive against Austria through Germany, he became famous as a victorious general during this campaign. And when he reached Austria, he overstepped his mandate and began negotiating the peace directly with the Austrian government. He did it because he thought, and he was right, that his new prestige as a victorious general, after the brilliant campaign he had just achieved, would protect him, and also because he wanted to outshine other generals and be the one who had obtained peace with uh, the biggest enemy of France at the time on the continent. Arguably, this was uh, reckless and uh, quite revealing of the way he always tried to force destiny and uh, advance his cause. I tell you about the man in a minute. Shielded by uh, this fresh popularity and uh, the political weakness of the directory, in Paris, he succeeded. The peace with Austria, through which France annexed Belgium, that was uh, previously Austrian, is remembered as uh, his achievement, even though he was just officially a general, not a diplomat or a politician. Together with other treaties, this peace with Austria put an end to this first coalition of countries against revolutionary France. And in 1797, after five years of conflict, peace was almost back. Almost, because no peace had been signed with Great Britain. War between France and Great Britain was in a standstill. On land, the British couldn't do much more than support other countries in their war effort because their land army was too small and too stretched to start a frontal campaign on the continent. But all these continental powers like Spain, Prussia, Austria had made peace at this point. On the seas, the Royal Navy dominated and could prevent any invasion of Great Britain. There were skirmishes and small-scale operations in the colonies, mainly in America, but nothing that would convince either side of asking for peace. So the state of war continued. But soon, the new coalition, later called the Second Coalition, would rise against this new France, that not only threatened its neighbors because of its anti-royalist nature, it also threatened to invade them and take their land with its expansionist policies. Before we talk about this second coalition and the rise to power of Napoleon that culminated in the proclamation of an empire, let's take a look at the character himself. The problem with that kind of great men in history is the weight of their legend. They become symbols of a period and they probably receive more praise and more attacks than they deserve, especially when they lived in the past two or three centuries and their lives are well documented. Early on, even before he became an emperor, Napoleon worked very actively on the promotion of a personal legend, and his opponents or enemies also elaborated a black legend that systematically paints him as a villain. Parts of it have 
passed to popular culture. For example, there is this widespread belief that he was short and that somehow his ambition and thirst for power were a way to compensate. That's not the case. He was of average size and his contemporaries had nothing to say about how tall he was. It seems this legend started with caricatures that made fun of him. I read that Napoleon is the one historical character that had the most books written about him. He's been scrutinized from every angle. There are a few traits that emerge from his personality. One thing that cannot be denied is his military genius. He had what looked like an innate capacity to imagine tactics and apply them to a battlefield. He won so many battles that he acquired a reputation for invincibility. That was not entirely true. He had setbacks too. But his track record as a general was uh, indeed uh, extraordinary. Apart from the military aspect, he was obviously very smart and quick to think and take decisions. It is not a personality trait, but another thing that followed him for the best part of his life was luck. He forced it more often than not but plenty of elements that were independent from his will helped him. He often ended up being in the right place at the right time. A rival would die in combat just when he could have stopped or slowed him in his rise. He even had luck with the weather or enemies' mistakes that helped him. Maybe all this luck, the accumulation of successes, and his practical intelligence obscured his judgment because he could also be very overconfident. He made huge mistakes, the biggest one being the decision to embark on the campaign of Russia that we will talk about later. But the capacity to win battles and organize armies made him very good at winning wars. On a more strategic level, he was not as competent. He didn't win the peace. He humiliated the vanquished, sometimes uselessly so. He took them so much that the seeds of the next war, of the next coalition, were always in every peace treaty he ever signed. On a more personal level, he was incredibly ambitious. You have to be to achieve such a rise, and also quite cynical. The cynicism appears in his correspondence and countless testimonies. He didn't seem to have many moral values. These were utilitarian things to him. He would praise and celebrate patriotism to mobilized the crowds, but personally he didn't feel that French for the best part of his rise to power. He was born in Corsica, in a family of the local nobility. They descended from minor Italian nobility. They had this element of status, the aristocracy, in their favor, but the family was financially modest. They were respected locally, but on the continent he was a nobody. Corsica had been bought by France a few years prior to the revolution from the Republic of Genoa, and Genoa had sold Corsica to essentially get rid of it, because the island was fiercely independent and hard to control. This attitude didn't change with the annexation of the island by the Kingdom of France. People in Corsica didn't see themselves as French at all, and they were culturally closer to Italy. 
French was a second language for Bonaparte. And when he was sent to the continent, to France as a child, to study at a military school, he was an outsider there. His attachment to France began when he really saw how much personal gain he could get by serving this country and later maybe be served by it. The cynicism extended to religion, which to him was mainly a political factor to be used or dealt with, that he considered advantageous to keep the population in its place. He also liked personal wealth. He never forgot it for the longest career, even when he had proclaimed himself emperor. And there was some vanity in him. He enjoyed being admired, even adulated. And yet, which is another layer of complexity to this character, he was not a shallow man. He had a solid classical culture. He was from a generation that was obsessed with ancient Rome specifically. They had an in-depth knowledge of everything that could be known about it. In the regime he created, the influence of this passion for Roman antiquity can be found on many levels. The aesthetic, if you look at the architecture and the neoclassical works of art he commissioned or patronized, the political references, in his next step towards supreme power, he contributed to end the directory at the head of the Republic, this system we talked about before with five directors, and it was replaced with something called the consulate, with three consuls. This was a direct reference to the triumvirate of the first century BC in the Roman Republic, and uh, the terminology itself, consul, comes from Rome. The shadow of ancient Rome is also in the attention paid to law and the administration of an empire. One of the legacies of the Napoleonic period is the Code Civil, the Civil Code, which has been amended regularly in the past two centuries but is still in use in France and many other countries that adopted it. So as you see, I think all of this calls for a nuanced portrait of Napoleon. On many accounts, he was a man of his time, just with a level of ambition and a military genius that stood out, that were out of the ordinary. and. He had also less respectable or impressive aspects to his personality. Thanks to his social class, the nobility, and uh, the limited financial means of the family, he was sent to study in France. And when the French Revolution erupted in 1789, he was already an artillery officer. He quickly raised through the ranks, thanks to his merits for a part, and also thanks to the intense lobbying he always made with his superiors to advance his career. Opportunities to rise in the army didn't lack, and at only 24, he became a general. In 1795, there was a short insurgency by royalists in Paris. And luckily for him, he was in Paris at the time, available to repress the insurgents, which he did successfully. As a reward for his loyalty to the government and contributions to the Republic, he was given command of the army of Italy during the War of the First Coalition. 
and as we have seen earlier, he could triumph against the Austrians and their Italian allies. When this campaign of Italy began, he was on the 26th, and thanks to the series of battles he won, plus the peace he took the initiative to negotiate with Austria, and also all the publicity for his exploits that he orchestrated to the point of creating a newspaper, a gazette, to inform the public of his triumphs that were obviously embellished on several occasions. All of this made him famous in France, and in two years he had turned himself into a war hero, a sensation. So we are now in 1798. Napoleon had returned victorious from Italy, and his star was shining bright. But he was not alone. Other generals, like Moreau, had also covered themselves in glory. At the time there was a general perception that the current regime of the directory this group of five directors at the head of the government that had succeeded the more radical period of the terror was quite fragile and uh, that its days were probably numbered. Politically, the directory was at odds with the previous period. It was a regime made by and for this new elite that had benefited the most from the first years of the revolution, the bourgeois and well-to-do segments of the population, and its priorities were to sort out the war situation, the budgetary financial problems which were still acute despite all the military victories, and above all protect the gains of the revolution, especially the sale of national assets, which meant avoiding at all costs a return to the ancient order. The directory was unpopular, especially with the more modest working class. In the previous phase, that we could call more leftist of the revolution, a number of measures had been taken to alleviate the deep economic trouble, actually the misery of the poorest, such as freezing the prices of grain and bread to stop the activity of speculators that had been thriving in the first years of the revolution. As a representant of the bourgeoisie, bankers and merchants, business and asset owners, the directory abolished all this to reinstate the kind of laissez-faire economy that prevailed before. But it didn't make it popular with large parts of the population. And even the wealthy were not all satisfied, because to sort out the public debt problem, the directory declared a bankruptcy. It defaulted on two-thirds of the debt, inflicting huge losses on the creditors. It worked quite well. This bankruptcy in 1797 is the last time the French state has defaulted on its debt. But the bottom line is that the directory was liked by almost no one and despised by many. All informed people in Paris knew that one way or another it would fall. Even the directors knew it, and ultimately some of them were involved in the coup that would later put an end to their own government and propel Napoleon to the top of the state. But not yet. Before that, Napoleon led an expedition that remains among the most famous episodes of his adventures, the campaign of Egypt. Why did revolutionary France send an expedition to Egypt in 1798? It looked like a good idea at the time. 
the reasons invoked for this expedition were rather dubious. One was that the last country still at war with France, Great Britain, derived a good part of its means of its wealth from its trade with India and East Asia. Invading Egypt would be a way to cut the road to India or create a faster one. This was true in the sense that trade between India and Britain was already intense, especially in fabrics and cotton that fed the nascent British industry. Except it didn't really work as a reason for invading Egypt, because at the time there was no Suez Canal. It was dug decades later. So all trade between India and Britain traveled south of Africa and in the Atlantic Ocean. There was no plan to push this invasion as far as India by land, which would have been unrealistic because of the distance. Another reason that made more sense was scientific. The passion for the antiquity was not receding, and ancient Egypt was an unknown world, an unknown continent to the Europeans and a fascinating one, more ancient and mysterious than Rome and Greece. Scholars participated in the expedition, and they laid the foundations of Western Egyptology in those years, which was the main legacy of this expedition. Then there were less official reasons, but as often, they were the main ones. War with Great Britain was in a standstill, and the government was looking for something to do. They couldn't come up with another better front line to open, and this weighed in the choice of Egypt. The campaign was also supported by allies and enemies of Napoleon alike. Everyone was aware that several generals could take the initiative or be the instrument of a coup d'etat. Bonaparte was one of them. He was too popular to get rid of him, but sending him away on a dangerous expedition would guarantee that he would not intend to coup, at least in the short term and with luck he could even die there, which would have been even better. But Napoleon and his supporters were not against the idea either, because they thought the situation was not mature enough for a coup yet in 1798. In the meantime, Bonaparte could not just wait and see in Paris and see his uh, Italian and Austrian glory slowly fade. He needed action. Replicating in Egypt his triumph in Italy could only do him good, and the risk of military failure was limited, because this time the opponents would not be the modern Austrian soldiers, but local fighters, the Mamluks, the Mamluks formed a militia that unofficially controlled Egypt at the time. The country was supposed to be a province of the Ottoman Empire, but in practice the Ottomans were in a state of weakness at this point, and they barely controlled provinces that were far away from Turkey and the Balkans. So, for reasons that had more to do with internal politics than military strategy, the choice of this expedition was made, and many risks were overlooked. Risks such as having to face the more powerful British Royal Navy in the Mediterranean Sea, or infuriating the Ottomans, 
for centuries, France and the Ottomans had been informal allies because they had similar interests, especially against Austria. They had never been at war, and even though the Ottoman Empire was now only the shadow of what it used to be, losing this connection was a big cost. In 1798, 40,000 men sailed to Egypt on the French Mediterranean fleet, and at first it all went well. They could reach Egypt without being intercepted by the British fleet, which was commanded by Admiral Nelson. The British knew about this expedition. It was too big to hide, but they couldn't locate the French ships. However, after Napoleon's army had disembarked, they could spot the fleet unprepared along the coast of Egypt at a place called Aboukir and destroy it. This meant that the road back to France for this army was now cut and an entire fleet had been lost for nothing at this point. But on land, Napoleon delivered, as he usually did. The main battle against the Mamluks took place near Cairo, the Battle of the Pyramids, and the French expeditionary forces obliterated the Mamluk army. Mamluk cavalry was no match for soldiers with much better guns, high discipline, and very uh, experimented after their European campaigns. This battle is called the Battle of the Pyramids and immediately Napoleon made sure it would be told and spinned as it should be to keep building his legend. There were other minor fights, but overall the army quickly took control of Egypt. Mission accomplished, except it had not accomplished much against the British. The Ottomans were now also at war with France, and the army was beginning to suffer from attrition because of diseases and a climate it was not used to or equipped for. Out of better options, Napoleon moved to the Levant, beginning to invade the Middle East. But on his way were Ottoman fortresses that resisted much more and caused heavy losses. He had to retreat, and uh, he understood that the expedition that was supposed to comfort his image of war hero was in fact close to uh, turning into a disaster, a drag on his reputation. The entire army could no longer be brought back to France. The fleet was gone, so uh, he abandoned the men there and returned alone to Paris. The journey on the Mediterranean Sea was a big risk, but doing nothing was worse for him. So he took it, and as usual, he was lucky. He could return to France and somehow sell the expedition as a success. Egypt was now under control of the army he had left there, he had been victorious and now ready to take on other missions for the glory of the Republic. In reality, the army that he left there slowly disbanded and Egypt was lost in the following years. But the political situation had moved on and he was never held accountable for the ultimate failure or uselessness of this campaign. Actually, for him, it was a success since the expedition had been a springboard to political power. I told you before that the fragility of the directory system and the high probability of a coup was an open secret in Paris. So much that instead of just putting up with events, 
politicians in and around the directory were willing to organize it themselves. They chose Bonaparte as the general who would participate in the coup because they needed one in order to take control of the institutions of the elected assembly and suppress any reaction to the coup, they needed troops, and troops obeyed to their generals, especially when they had the glorious aura that came with victories. The plotters had prepared everything for a peaceful operation. One of them was Napoleon's own brother, Lucien Bonaparte, in parallel to his brother's military career, he had made a successful political career and was president of one of the two houses of the legislature. Like the House of Representatives and the Senate in the US, or the House of Commons and the House of Lords in the UK, there were two houses, a lower house with the final say. It was called the Council of 500 and an upper house, the Council of the Ancients. The day of the coup was full of twists and turns and sometimes it even bordered on comedy. And this is why I'm going to tell you a bit more about the coup itself. Lucien Bonaparte was president of the lower house and the plan he engineered was to persuade both councils falsely that a left-wing coup was happening in Paris. Both houses would be persuaded to be escorted outside Paris to a suburban chateau under protection from troops obviously commanded by Napoleon Bonaparte. At the same time, Three of the five directors would resign. Two of them were part of the coup and they bought the resignation of a third one. The resignation of 60% of the directory, three out of five, would trigger its dissolution and the two assemblies, intimidated by the troops outside Paris, would be persuaded to appoint a commission that would drew up a new constitution, obviously tailored to the plotter's specifications. The plan was a bit complicated, but its advantage was to preserve appearances by making the two councils vote so that the whole process would appear somewhat legal. But things didn't go as planned at all, and the day of the coup followed a bizarre turn of events from which Bonaparte exited as the new strongman of the country, which was not anticipated at all. The directors resigned, as expected, but the two councils quickly understood that they were facing a coup orchestrated from within the directory and even within their own assemblies began conversing and refused to follow the instructions of the plotters. As things didn't turn out as expected, and he was growing impatient, Bonaparte entered one of the two assemblies with a small group of soldiers, changing the nature of the coup that now became a military thing. He had to retreat faced with the furious reaction of the council's members, and he went to the other council, which was gathering in another room, where he tried to take the stage and convince them. But under pressure, given the huge stakes and the hundreds of members of the parliament he had to face, he completely lost it and started an incoherent speech that infuriated people even more. What exactly followed is a bit unclear. He may have been physically assaulted, 
or he injured himself. But in any case, the soldiers heard screams, and uh, some of them came to his rescue, allowing him to escape. Then a motion was raised in the, the Council of 500 to outlaw this general, who was violating the two houses of parliament, and this put Napoleon into a very precarious position. If this motion had passed, and the councils had remained in control, he would have been outlawed and probably executed, ending everything abruptly. But his brother Lucien saved him. He exited the council of 500, and he told the troops that a minority of deputies were terrorizing the council, which was an outright lie. But when that worked, the troops stormed the room and they expelled the council. The other council, the ancients, was also taken control of militarily and had to pass a decree that appointed three men to the head of the government, three consuls instead of directors previously, three plotters actually, including Napoleon himself who had come around and now appeared as the new strongman. Out of this chaotic day, which bordered on comedy, as I said, Napoleon had more or less intentionally made a coup within the coup. And with his control of the army in Paris, he would make sure in the following month that his position of power was set, if not in stone, at least in the law, with a new constitution that was hastily redacted, he became first consul, which gave him preeminence over the other two. In a few weeks, he had become the most powerful man in France. He would soon find the appetite for even higher functions and titles. He would not share his power for long. And with the control of France, he also took control of the formidable war machine that came with it, an experimented, well-equipped army that he would develop much further and use to accomplish ever-increasing dreams of domination. Dreams that would quickly no longer be the dreams of a country looking for its way after it had dismantled the ancient order but the dreams of a single man, threatened by hubris. But this part of the story will be for our next talk. In the meantime, we have reached the end for today, and you can now let go and sleep, or look at the description for the second part. A link to it will be available as soon as it is out. Goodbye for now. I leave you to the sweet sound of the rain outside. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.